acknowledge the contribution of the Heilbronn Institute to this lecture. And now let me introduce the speaker. And you know, everybody here knows the business of how you introduce the speakers. You explain to the audience how wonderful they are, how much you should look forward to their talk. But I am a truthful person. <laughs> so I will tell you now why you should be horrified. <laughs> So, you know the tradition of BMC and BAMC. BMC is always very, very pure. BAMC is always very, very applied. Stan Osher is somewhere in the middle. So, the BMC people among you will be completely horrified that Stan Osher received, was a plenary speaker at the International Congress of Industrial and Applied Mathematics, indeed received this Pioneer Prize in 2003, received in 2005 the Siam Kleinman Prize, and two years ago the Siam John von Neumann Prize. On the other hand, the, the BAMC people among you will be horrified in Stan being a both a past plenary speaker at the International Mathematical Congress and in winning the Carl Friedrich Gauss Prize at the latest ICN. And it is always good to unite this audience in joint horror, <laughs> so it is my great pleasure to introduce Stan Osher. Okay. Well, thanks, Ari, and thanks, everybody, for this incredible conference. A convex combination includes all the mathematics and everything else, actually. Uh, and I'll talk about convex optimization, so it's related. So the title is uh, what, you, what L1 Optimization Can Do For You, in particular about PDE. Uh, but let's start with some related notions. Uh, many of you know this at least as well as I do, but it's a general audience, so let's go through it. Uh, compressive sensing, uh, which was done by Galileo, I think, but anyway, it was uh, done beautifully by Donahoe, Candez, and Tao. Uh, and there's also related notions of L1 optimization, variational methods and image processing, and level set method. Uh, but here's the main diagram which every beginning sparse talk starts with. Here we go. Uh, suppose you want to solve an equation AU equals F, where A is uh, short and fat, which means uh, fewer equations than are known. For example, here we have two equations in, uh, sorry, one equation in two unknowns, and we want to get the smallest um, number of non-zero uh, elements of the solution. So that means sparsity, right? So sparsity means solve that equation and get the solution with the smallest number of non-zero components. And it turns out that by minimizing the L1 norm, you get that. And this is the primordial diagram. If you take that uh, straight line and see where it intersects the L1 ball, the L1 ball is this wonderful diamond that we are familiar with in baseball, and it hits it on an axis. And the axis has one non-zero component, and that is the whole bloody idea of this thing, that you can solve this nonlinear, sorry, this uh, underdetermined problem by using L1 optimization, and that's a convex problem. L0 is not convex. In fact, uh, it's uh, hard to solve. And this is what you're not allowed to do in my zip code, the L2 min uh, unit ball. Uh, that was probability one will hit the straight line at a place where there are two non-zero components. So that's the deal. L1 good, L2 bad. L1 is good because it's convex, and yet it has this nice uh, sparsity property. In particular, L1 has this corner, and that corner is terrific. It's useful. It's unusual in numerical analysis that lack of smoothness helps you, but it does here. Okay. This is, this is not my stuff, but it's a nice review. For example, suppose you take that one equation in 10,000 unknowns, A u equals F, and you want to solve it. Uh, you take the L1 minimum, and suppose there's one A k, which is the biggest. So you have one equation, and God knows how many unknowns. And you want to get a solution which is as sparse as possible, which means one non-zero element. The L1 uh, optimum of that is going to be this. So L1 gives you a sparse solution. The theory doesn't guarantee that, but it does. And 
and L2 gives you a, the non-sparsest solution possible, probably. It's proportional to the vector A. So that's why this is a big deal. Compressed sensing uh, constructs high-resolution images from a small number of measurements. You can uh, do this, and this has made a big impact, would you believe, already in medical imaging. Uh, so in, uh, for MRIs, for example, you don't acquire images. You acquire the case-based data, which I can think of as the Fourier transform. Uh, what you want to do is construct a high-resolution image from a fraction of the uh, Fourier data, which means if you lie in this blasted machine, which I have done in my life, uh, you spent uh, about one-fifth one of the time nowadays and get the same answer, which is a big deal. So this is something which really hit. If you go to Google and type in MRI slash total variation or MRI slash compressive sensing, you will get uh, many, many, many uh, hits papers, whatnot. So this happened quickly. Uh, <clears throat> so this is work with Tom Goldstein. Uh, the idea is how do you solve this problem? Remember what we want to do. Let's go backwards a little bit. Uh, you minimize the L1 norm such that AU equals F. That's what this whole thing amounts to. And the deal is to do it quickly. And with Goldstein, we did this brilliant thing of rederiving uh, something and call, giving it a new name and getting 2,000 hits on Google. So there's a moral of the story there. Uh, it's uh, the. Uh, let me go keep going. Here we go. Sorry, wrong way. No, here we go. Okay, so here's an example. Uh, we're going to use something called split Bregman method. Bregman is alive and well, not well actually, but alive and living in the desert in Israel. He wrote about one paper or two papers, but he did something really interesting. Uh, and it turns out to be equivalent to classical methods, but we have a different interpretation. So here's an example. Uh, upper left is the original image. Upper right is uh, what happens when you take the Fourier transform and sample 25% of the data and reconstruct using setting everything that's not, you don't know equal to zero, which is a terrible thing to do. The lower left is the reconstruction using the wavelet basis, and lower right is using total variation minimization. Total variation is the L1 norm of the gradient, and that's equivalent. That's uh, uh, the same kind of theory ap applies, only recently been proven, actually, uh, that if you minimize total variation for, uh, under, for sparse reconstruction, you can get the exact solution under reasonable circumstances uh, with, very, with fewer measurements than you'd expect. Okay, uh, so here's an example, full case space. And uh, the nice thing about these, this so-called split Bregman method or whatever, all Bregman methods is that you get the, a pretty close answer very quickly. This stuff gives you back the edges very, very quickly. It also gives you back spikes when you do L1 very quickly. Uh, the, the other stuff takes a while. The smooth stuff slows down. But the general features come back very, very quickly. So you can see in the bottom, the lower left is what you get with split Bregman. And uh, you keep going. After 30 iterations, you get something that looks good. If you show the final reconstruction to a radiologist, he will get upset uh, because it's too good. It's better than the original. And that's because we denoise as we go. So you learn from bitter experience. Don't show him the end. Uh, stop before it's over. Okay. Uh, so on the right, you get, you, this is what you get using compressed sensing. Okay, so how do you do this? Well, this is, let me just give you a little bit of the algorithm, then we'll get to the PDE stuff. So this is joint work with Bo Tao Yin, who's a smart kid at UCLA. He's not a kid, he's a full professor, but I'm old. Okay. Uh, <coughs> Bregman iteration is insanely successful, uh, and not that original. Uh, there's a guy named Roland Glowinski, who's a friend of mine still, which is surprising, uh, considering that we, did, we rediscovered something that he had done and made a whole to-do about it. Uh, but he never used it for L1 or TV, and that's where it's really, 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 really useful. So this is what we're talking about now is this Bregman iteration, which for those in the know is the same as uh, ADMM, alternating direction method of multipliers. Uh, but we didn't know, anyway. Uh, but uh, there's a different interpretation. So what it does is, among other things, it gives you better regularization quality when you want to denoise or reconstruct and this is the operative diagram, the Bregman distance. Uh, can you see that? Yeah. Uh, I hate pointers, but anyway. 
See that V on the right? That V is the absolute value. And the absolute value is wonderful. It's much better than x squared, which is that round thing. If you do Bregman distance and Bregman iteration for things like uh, grad u squared or, or uh, norm of L2 norm of u squared, it's not fast, nothing special. But if you do it for L1, it is super duper fast. And that is because of that lovely V over there. Uh, uh, and the subgradient is a uh, function which is, which is actually a derivative. If it's smooth, then it's a, it's a line which is, uh, gives you that Bregman distance to be non-negative for a convex function. Okay. Uh, so Bregman iteration turns out to be very simple. If you want to solve this problem, all you do is, uh, if you want to solve the constrained optimization problem, uh, you uh, take a sequence of uh, unconstrained problems and solve, solve similar exact same format except you add back the error. So the operative thing is the lower uh, equation over there. Every subproblem is the same as the original problem. And the beauty of this thing is that very, very quickly you get close to an answer which looks right in the sense that the, uh, the spikes come back and or if you're doing total variation, the edges come back very fast. And there's a reason for that. So, for example, compressive sensing from noisy input. Uh, if, you, uh, if you look at line uh, equation one, if you solve that thing, you are uh, solving the uh, unconstrained problem, minimizing mu times the L1 norm plus the error squared. Bregman takes the sequence of those minimizers. So there's the original sparse sense uh, signal, which is a bunch of spikes in 1D. Uh, if you try to solve it with a not enough mu, not enough L1, you get back stuff which doesn't look that great. If you make uh, mu a little bit better, you get it's sparse, but there's poor fitting. However, the spikes are in the right place. Where's Lamont? I mean, it, it, uh, it's more or less finds you the right locations almost always. Uh, but if you do Bregman, after a few iterations, you're right on the money down below. Uh, and there's lots of other examples which I'll go through uh, quickly. Uh, so this is, okay. <coughs> Here's the uh, important sentence. Every step of the game when you solve this problem, you are solving a constrained optimization problem uh, to get the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, you're solving an unconstrained to get the constrained. And if the subproblems are solved inexactly, the solution is still, ac is still accurate. You don't have to solve those linear equ equations you get, or together with the L1 shrink operator. Exactly, only a few iterations work, and there's a reason for that. There's something called error forgetting. This is a method which forgives and forgets errors. Life should be that way. Uh, you, you can make mistakes in every iteration, and at the end, pizzawi, you're on the money. And there's a reason for that, okay. So there's all kinds of silly theorems that were proven uh, either by us or rediscovered by us, uh, this thing converges. It converges in great generality, not just for L1. So the theoretical convergence results are really understated because the complexity of convergence could be e to the n to the e to the something, and it's five instead. It's very fast. Uh, but there's no cons there are no complexity estimates that are reasonable. Uh, okay. You can prove finite convergence. It converges in a, for, for a finite dimensional problem, it converges in a finite uh, dimension, in a finite number of steps, but that number could be large. But there's error cancellation by God. That's the big deal. There's a happy result due to adding back. And let me just show you the numerical results and we'll get on to explain why that happened. Where is it? Here's an error cancellation example. You're solving uh, AU equals B. There are 250 projections. A has Gaussian random uh, elements. You run Bregman, each subproblem is inexactly solved. Inexactly solved, like one sweep of Gauss Seidel, for example, is all you need to do if for, if for a reasonable A. Uh, <coughs> and then we use classical methods that are six or seven years old. They're better ones now. Well, they're still pretty good. But we solve inexactly with uh, some error, 10 to the minus six. And even though we solve in exactly, after one iteration of this nonsense, you get 10 to the minus two, two iterations, aha, 10 to the minus seven. Three iterations, 10 to the minus 14. So even though the, you're solving in exactly, 
the, uh, the uh, constrained approximations, wait a second, unconstrained, you get the constrained solution almost exactly in three iterations. And that's because of L1, by God. It's only because of L1 or TV. This stuff only works well for homogeneous degree one uh, penalty functions. If you do this for L2, you will be disappointed. And that's why uh, this stuff became popular. So uh, this is also part of the, something called augmented Lagrangian. And uh, this is another thing we rediscovered, which is Bregman iteration itself. And that was uh, not regarded as very important in optimization. For example, it wasn't in the book by Boyd and Vandenberg, which is a really good book. That's because they weren't doing L1. And now it's a big deal. Okay. So classical results require diminishing tolerances, but we don't need it. Why is that? And the answer is there's error forgetting, and I'll get to that in a minute. Okay, I don't want to spend too much time. There are generalizations of all this. My God, 20 minutes already. Okay. So there are simplifications. Uh, there's something called linearized Bregman, which is right over here, and that's not the same as uh, IST, what is it called? Iterative, uh, iterative source thresholding, by God. It is not. This gives you back the constrained optimization problem, uh, not the unconstrained. Just a two line code, and you can solve this blasted problem. Very simple. Two line code. There are faster ways, but this is re reliable and gives you the answer. Okay, so let me get to. And then there's operating splitting, which is very important, and that's uh, split Bregman, which I probably won't have time to go into. But here's something I want to show you. L1-based Bregman iteration forgives and forgets errors. I love this. Okay. Uh, what you're doing is solving this uh, Bregman distance, that's dj, plus 1 half au minus f squared. And every step of the game, you are sloppy, making numerous errors. However, 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 uh, you arrive at a UK such that two things happen. This, the first one is not so simple. The subgradient, which means the subgradient of L1 component-wise is plus one if it's, it's positive, minus one if it's negative, and something very interesting if it's zero, between plus one and minus one. So all you need is that the subgradient is, is in the range of A transpose, but here's the important thing. If you have a vector U star solving A U star equals F, and the Bregman distance between that, that U star and UK is uh, zero, then the next iteration is the answer. Doesn't matter how you got there. And this second criteria, that the Bregman distance is zero for L1, is very, very simple to satisfy. For example, if you're solving for a sparse problem with one non-zero component, all you need is that UK that you've gotten in your iterative procedure has the same sign, that component, as the AU star. So if you have 100, all you got to do is match up the zeros and you're finished. That's a lie, because you need, the, you need condition one, but it's a good thing to say. Okay, condition one is a little more complicated. And that's because L1 is L1, which is the most profound thing I've said so far. Uh, for example, the, the distance equals zero means that the, the absolute value of uh, U star at that component minus U star times the signum equals zero. That's all you need. Now, on the other hand, if it was strictly convex and you were solving for L, uh, u squared, that couldn't happen unless you were finished. So uh, this, this will finish. That's why L1 is terrific for this thing. L1 good, L2 bad. Remember that. Okay. Uh, so that, and the proof of that is too simple to go into. It's very straightforward. Okay. So that's the end of the beginning. And now we're coming to the uh, middle, which is the new stuff, more or less, and relatively new. Although... The world is a very funny place. Uh, and this new stuff was done originally in 1974 by Chaim Berzis, who is still a good friend of mine, thankfully. Uh, <coughs> there is a link between these ideas and differential equations. And that's relatively new. Okay. Uh, so now let's think about calculus of variations type problems in physics. And that's, that's the sort of the newish stuff. Okay. Here we go. Think continuously. If you add L1 to a variational problem, you expect what you get to be zero in lots of places. Now let's take calculus of variations type problems that we know and love. Minimize the integral of ux squared minus fu, which will give you uxx equals minus f, for example. 
But add to that 1 over mu, a constant mu, times the L1 norm of u. And the L1 norm of u, I'm now talking continuously. Of course, when you implement it, it's all numerical. But this is a, this is a result about differential equations, which goes back to a nice paper by Brazis in 1974, which was ignored uh, for the most part. Uh, but anyway, it's a good paper, it's a really good paper. Uh, P of u is the subgradient of u, as I said before. That means that the, uh, that the L1 norm of v minus the L1 norm of u minus that quantity is greater than or equal to zero, but because of homogeneity, it means that for any v in u, the L1 norm of v is greater than or equal to the inner product of v P of u, which means that if u is positive, uh, P of u is one. If, uh, uh, if u is negative, you can show that. If u is negative, P of u is minus one. And if uh, u is zero, then it's between plus one and minus one. <coughs> okay. And the addition of the L1 term, here's the key idea. Going back to this PDE problem, if you wrote uxx equals minus f, we all know more or less that you're not going to get regions of zeros unless f is really bizarre. And for example, if you have a boundary value problem, you get, you get sines or cosines or God knows what all, which are very global, right? Adding this L1 term changes everything. Uh, it shrinks the support of u. The support decreases, that's the new idea, which is 40 years old and buried in some obscure paper, but anyway, it's a good idea. Uh, if you add an L1 term to a nice uh, elliptic uh, calculus of variation problem, what you get is a function which is zero in lots of places. And it, in fact, it has compact support. And this has uh, somehow related, this is definitely a precursor of compressive sensing, actually, if you think about it, surprisingly. Okay. Although when I told uh, Razis that, he never heard of compressive sensing. Now he does it. Okay, so similarly for the heat equation, if you write ut minus uxx equals that, uh, same kind of thing is true. Instead of getting a Gaussian when you insert a delta function, you get something with compact support. Ain't that cute? And why do I care uh, about this? Other than the fact that it's fun. It is fun. This was noticed by Brzezis in 74 and uh, generalized a little bit by Brzezis and Friedman in 76, the PDEs. And Kafelish, me, and another guy had written this beautiful, incredible paper, and then Brzees walked into my office. This is a true story, actually. Uh, three days after we submitted it, I started telling him about it. He said, aha, you read my paper. I said, what? Uh, so it turned out that he had done something very similar earlier without thinking about applications or numerics or anything else, but he did it, the little twerp. And, uh, and not only that, but he got it right. Usually when somebody does something like this, I say, well, you know, he had it right. But anyway, here's the intuition. Uh, you can actually show pretty easily, intuitively, that th this thing will shrink the support. Let's go back to the equation, See this one. Uh, yo, 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 which one? Yeah, the, the uh, uxx equals minus f plus. Integrate that, the, the equation in the middle. uxx equals this minus f plus blah, blah, blah. OK. If you integrate an equation and suppose u is positive on the interval, you can show that the length of the interval, x2 minus x1, is less than or equal to mu times the integral of f. So that gives you an estimate as to how long the interval can be. It's a, it's a trivial statement because u, x, u was positive, it came down and did this. If u was negative, it would go up and do that. In both cases, you can show the length of the interval is bounded by something which goes to zero as mu goes to zero. And uh, that's the intuition behind all this, OK? This is very useful, it turns out, in obtaining spatially localized solutions to problems in mathematical physics and lots of other places, too, which I'll talk about, such as finding compactly supported approximations to eigenfunctions of Schrodinger equations. Uh, there's a whole industry out there, and there's even a website, which I just found out about, uh, in this trip, uh, in which people do this, but not this way. If you solve the equation, showing an equation that looks like this, this is joint work, by the way, with Vidvid Zosalan, uh, Ranji Lai, a whole bunch of other people, Russ Kaflish, and uh, a couple of postdocs and graduate students who are really good. 
this is motivated by what's called one-year functions, which are developed in physics and quantum chemistry. So take the uh, problem Laplacian U, or one-half Laplacian U. Physicists are crazy. They put a one-half for some reason. Uh, plus V of X. And you have eigenvalues. Uh, we're not going to talk about boundary conditions for the moment, but there's some boundary conditions or periodicity or I don't know what, even, even, uh, v even uh, infinite region if uh, V is okay. And you get a ground state energy for a finite system of n electrons. Uh, and you get that by solving a variational problem. You minimize this functional. This is standard stuff uh, to get eigenfunctions. So what we're doing is getting eigenfunctions of Laplacian plus V. And you get functions phi which are densely supported. For example, if V was zero, you're going to get sines and cosines. They are pretty densely supported. Okay? But physicists don't like that. They don't want things to be that global. So for the last 50, 60 years, uh, what they, uh, there's something called one year function, 1937. What they do, and very cleverly in some ways, is they get a bunch of the uh, first n eigenfunctions. They rotate the coordinate system by unitary transformation, and then they do some mumbo jumbo to cut off infinity. They try to rotate it as much as possible to make the, you know, the values outside some, some set to be small, and then they truncate. We, on the other hand, by George, just add an L1 regularization. So that's the deal. This is the new idea. Instead of getting compactly supported approximations to Schrodinger equation by classical techniques, we just add 1 over mu times the sum of the first cj, like so. And that changes the variational problem. But, he claims, I claim, it makes it faster. Uh, because the CJs you're going to get have compact support, and everything, every time you do an SVD or whatever it is you do there, you have inner products, and these are going to have smaller support in the inner product space. So you, th this, is, this is the operative thing. To get eigenfunctions of uh, Schrodinger operator and have them be approximations with compact support, all you got to do is take 1 over a constant times the sum of the L1 norms and have a nine-line code to do it. So, of course, you know, we're taking uh, the usual stuff about eigenfunctions. Cj inner product Ck is delta Jk, which means uh, orthonormal. This can be solved with split Bregman, which I'll show you the code in a minute, uh, which is very similar to what I was talking about before. And L1 helps you. This stuff converges pretty fast. It not, it's not, there's a theorem, there's no theorem, I should say. It's non-convex uh, because we have a projection onto the eigenspace. So in the middle of our uh, split Bregman business, which I haven't really described too well, which is a convex optimization, we, we have a step in which we project onto an eigenspace and then we repeat. And there's all kinds of theorems that we've proven, some of which could be better and could be improved. Uh, first of all, the compressed modes have compact support. That's nice to know. They really do have compact support. If mu is big enough or small enough, depending on where I'm putting it, I guess big enough. Uh, and it's an estimate of support. Moreover, as uh, the mu gets bigger, they, can, they converge in L2 to the original eigenfunction. So they are true approximations. They are true approximations. And these are not mealy-mouthed, wiggly approximations. These come in and go kazawi. They hit zero very nicely, C1 plus alpha. Okay. Uh, <coughs> and the sub-eigenspace spanned by the first M eigenfunctions can be approximated by the first N compressed modes with improvable accuracy. So these, this has all been proven. Uh, there's also something called shift invariance. There's a new result, which I should put up here by one of our students who's a really smart kid. Uh, he shows that uh, these things give you a complete orthonormal basis. Isn't that cool? You're solving a nonlinear problem. Uh, and you get a spectral theorem out of it. So uh, by solving Laplacian V plus V, uh, sorry, Laplacian U plus or minus whatever it is, plus V times U is equal to lambda U plus this signum function times a constant, you get a complete set of eigenfunctions, which is nice. He only proved it up to dimension two because of Weyl's lemma only works in dimension two. But it's, uh, I'm pretty sure it's true in general. Uh, his name is Omar Tekken, I should have put it here. There's also something called shift invariance. I'm not going to spend too much time, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, time's fine, on uh, details of what this stuff is about. 
uh, you want shift orthogonality. Uh, and you can use L1 uh, regularization in a, very, in a very fast algorithm to get obtain localized approximations directly. Again, it's with these guys. I should give, give credit to Vidvids, Ozelin, the first author. He's the one who just assumed that since we were adding L1, we could do it and add it to uh, this continuous calculus of variation problem, and it would work, and it did. So uh, he's a material scientist and a good guy. Everybody's at UCLA here. Uh, maybe I'll skip the details about this technical stuff about Schrodinger equation, so we can talk about it offline. Uh, there's all this stuff about the Brion zone and so on. Let me just show you the important stuff, which is the algorithm. Here it is. You input these first CJs, you initialize, and while, and while not converged, you solve equation three, which is an easy equation because everything there is quadratic, uh, so that's a linear problem, okay? That's nice and linear. So one thing, the, if you can take away anything from this business, if you're not an expert in this area, that it's very easy to become an expert in this area. The only thing different between L2 optimization and L1 optimization is something called the, the shrink operator, soft thresholding. That is, you minimize the absolute value of x plus a constant times x minus f squared. That's it. That's the only thing, that's the only nonlinear step in all these stupid things. That's it. Except that here we have some projection, which is, has to do with orthonormality. But otherwise, L1 is just like L2, except one nonlinear step, period. And that nonlinear step often speeds up the calculation. Isn't that nice? That it often speeds up the calculation. So it's called the, the shrink operator, soft thresholding, whatever you want to call it. And it has lots of uh, history uh, in terms of uh, statistics, which I won't go into. Okay, so this is the, uh, the, the step four is this projection onto orthonormal uh, stuff, which is fast. I won't go into it. And that's, that's the non-convex step. Step five is the one I just mentioned. Minimize the L1 norm of V, some constant, that mu should, that U should be a mu, sorry, plus gamma times phi minus V squared. Uh, that is a scalar problem. So the only difference between the original way of getting eigenfunctions that you learn in the Merck linear algebra practically and this business is this shrink step, period. That's it, that's it, the only difference. And the rest of it now, this Bregman business means you add back the error and you repeat. Okay. And uh, here's a potential, for example, I'll show you some quick results. Here's a potential with a V of X. These are what these one year functions look like. If you think that they look like, and those of you who know about this stuff, may year wavelets, you're right, except they have compact support, which means that they're not compactly supported in Fourier space. But they're pretty close to things what look like sinks. Uh, and they give you orthonormal basis, okay? This is 1D. We've done higher dimensions, but I don't have it here. And this is some kind of accuracy thing, showing that the, the, this, these things being on top of each other show, means that the real eigenfunctions and these guys are close to each other from mu big enough, okay? So that's part two. Let me get out of here now, escape. Hang on for a second. This, I may uh, have to call for help in a minute. Let's see what we get here. Uh, where am I? Uh, fade plan, so I can get this thing. Uh, where is, how do I make it big over here? Where the heck do I, where's the thing that maximizes this thing? Uh, help. Click going. What? Uh, what do I click? Keep going. Uh, View. View, okay, hang on. Sorry, okay, thanks. This won't take long, sorry. Okay, so this is supposed to be an explanation of how the sparsity thing works. Uh, if you minimize this equation, you get the Euler-Lagrange equation, uh, and you get something that you learn about. This, I'm just doing 1D because it's, you can draw a phase plane. Uh, and you get this kind of phase plane thing, and you get this signum function. The absolute value of u is the operative thing right over here. Uh, and that gives you a discontinuity in the second derivative. So this is the kind of thing you get if you visualize it. Uh, this is the phase plane of this thing. 
And if gamma is small enough, you get uh, periodic things. If gamma is big enough, they don't quite make it. And if gamma is right on the money, zero, uh, you get these compactly supported things, which means it looks like this. This is what the solutions to these guys look like in XY space. This is what the solution view look like. Uh, and in the middle, for C equals zero, you get compact support. So instead of getting sine waves, you get things which are sort of like, almost like sine waves, and they go clunk and they hit the boundary, and smoothly, C1 plus alpha. And if you take enough of those, you will get the same, sp you get the, the same, s you get the span that you would have gotten without this uh, function mu, without this constant, this L1 term. Okay. Uh, so it's kind of cute. Okay. Let me escape from here. No signal. What do I do next? Uh, get rid of this thing. And let me give you one more example of all this, which is somewhere, where am I? Uh, obstacle problem. So let me go real fast so you don't see that as my students. Okay. And now I go to, that full screen comes here, right? Yep. Okay. Okay, we're talk about, so here's an example where this L1 stuff really plays a role. You can get a new algorithm for a classical problem, just as an example. Uh, it's a free boundary problem, Ellips elliptic obstacle problem. This is joint work with Gang, Gang Tran. These are her slides, this is my student. And uh, another uh, postdoc, who's a, uh, Hayden Schaefer, and a little bit of Ross Kaflish. Uh, we're going to do uh, a whole bunch of problems using L1, which are natural. I mean, we're not making, we're not doing something new where we're devising a, uh, uh, well, and before we were devising a new approach to an old problem. Here is, uh, I guess it's the same thing. Okay, so I'll skip some of these uh, <coughs> preliminary stuff. This is, the, uh, this is uh, why L0 is bad, it's M MP hard. L0 means minimize the number of non-zero elements. L1 is nice and convex. And uh, uh, under certain conditions, I'm just repeating what we said before, the L1 minimization can recover the sparse solutions. Lots of interesting work on this. Uh, phase retrieval and God knows what all, but let's talk about PDEs. Okay, so my goal these days, life is short, and what remains, what I want to do uh, is use ideas of this type uh, to solve differential equations, okay? Uh, and there's been a lot of interesting work in related areas, uh, some of which we mentioned before and some of which I'll cover right now. Uh, and there was a whole special session at SIAM uh, in CSC last meeting. Okay, here's the analog, sparsity is what on the left and compactly supported functions are on the right, and they are analogous. That's the point. So here we go. So I'm just repeating what was done before, but it doesn't hurt. Uh, if you minimize this functionally, you get this uh, uh, equation down below. It's a subgradient of the L1 norm, and you have the definition of the subgradient is down below which is basically a signum function, except where u equals zero. Uh, there's been a lot of very interesting work on this stuff, which I poo-pooed in my ignorance in the 70s, uh, because it's all scalar, but by Mike Crandall and Brazis and uh, Cato and Camora, uh, solving, this, solving solutions to this problem where it's multivalued. So this is, this is a differential equation which has when u equals zero, that subgradient has many possibilities. <coughs> it has to be in magnitude between minus one and plus one. And basically the result of uh, these guys is uh, that you get uh, a well-posed problem if you choose the value on the right which uh, annihilates f plus that. F, so f over lambda has to have a magnitude less than one. And that gives you uniqueness. That's basically what they proved a long time ago. Yeah. So many physically, many, many free boundary problems have compactly supported solutions. And the question is, how can we use it? So what we're going to do is solve the following few problems in the next 15 minutes. Uh, elliptic op obstacle problems, uh, two-phase membrane, Healy shore flow, and sand pile, would you please? Here's the elliptic obstacle problem. There it is. 
uh, shrink wrap. Uh, is there food? Okay. So consider the obstacle problem, which is minimize grad u squared such that u is greater than or equal to f. This is just one example, lots of interesting examples. So you get a variational inequality. Laplace and u greater than or equal to zero, u greater, uh, sorry, u greater than or equal to phi, what am I saying? Uh, and minus Laplace and u minus phi equals zero. This has been studied and far studied by smart people, especially Caffarelli. You can, con you can transform it. Here's what's new in our approach. Uh, which seems to be new. Uh, you can transform this problem, which is shrink wrapping this object, by minimizing grad u squared plus mu times, uh, and that should be the integral of max of u phi minus u comma zero. So the integral goes all over the place. And there's a benefit. If, if mu is big enough, the solution is the same as if you had just said that phi had to be, uh, uh, that u had to be greater than or equal to phi. If mu is infinity, if you put a mu equals infinity over there, that means uh, that u had better be bigger than phi, right? If mu is infinity, that pushes u to phi, and that becomes a constrained optimization problem. What we showed is that for a finite mu, it's still true. So you can, the constrained optimization problem, uh, which is a little bit radical, can be, uh, reduced to an unconstrained problem, which is a little bit easier. And we can use fast optimization techniques to solve the unconstrained optimization problem. So what we're going to do is introduce to numerical analysis the shrink operator and things like that. We'll be solving classical PDE problems using techniques that were borrowed from information science and borrowed from uh, compressed sensing. And uh, should be made uh, more, it should be made used more often, in my opinion. There you go. Uh, so the idea in order to solve this problem is minimize one half grad u squared plus mu times max phi minus zero. Again, the integrals are in front of everything. Uh, let v equal phi minus uh, mu, and you take this one more L, L1 looking uh, optimization. It's mu times max of v comma zero. So only the positive part of L1 is there. So you penalize when v is positive. You want v to be non-positive. Uh, non and again, you don't have to have mu equals infinity, and that speeds things up quite a bit. Okay. Very good. And you can, you can apply dear old Bregman to it, uh, and you get the following. The basic idea is, I should have said that, this, this split Bregman idea is a trivial idea, which goes back along, I mean, it starts with a very trivial idea. When you want to minimize uh, a function, the first thing involving u, you let phi equal v minus u, uh, sorry, v equal phi minus u, and then you make that a constraint, okay? And people in Quran, for example, in his book writes, uh, puts a big constant in front of lambda times the integral of that difference squared. That's not what we're doing. Bregman iteration doesn't do that. Uh, there's no big constants. We get it by iterating, and it's much faster. So here we go. So Bre dear old Bregman says that in order to get phi to equal, sorry, v to equal, mm, u equals phi, uh, phi minus v, you put a lambda times that quantity on the right, and at every step of the game, you're doing this minimization. And again, every step, if you look at it, if you solve for u, it's a linear problem. It's Laplacian u plus some linear nonsense. Uh, it's Poisson problem. If you solve for v one more time, it is the shrink operator. So what we do is solve one at a time. This is called split Bregman, which is also called ADMM, which is due to Gorwinski if he's listening out there in the, uh, in the air somewhere. Uh, and uh, <coughs> it converges. Okay. So this is exactly the same procedure that we used for, uh, um, in, in principle anyway, for the uh, information theory problem where you had a matrix A, uh, but this time we're solving PDEs. So here we go, here's the method. Uh, you discretize, of course, when you finally finish, you're solving it on a grid, so it's all discrete. Uh, and you use dear old split Bregman, uh, and you solve one at a time, first for V, then for U, and then uh, to repeat, all you do is change that quantity V, which is equivalent to Bregman iteration, to update it. 
So you split it into two, two problems, and here we go. Uh, line three is that you just solve Laplacian u minus lambda times the identity equals something. And down below, what's left over is just doing that shrink operator, which can be written this way. Uh, it's a very simple operator, and basically what it says is that uh, if z is greater than c, you write z minus c. If z is less than c, you write zero, period. Simple as that, to see a positive number. Okay. Again, uh, all these things, the only nonlinear step in all these problems is shrink, period, which is very encouraging. Uh, most works do it in this much more complicated way, in my opinion. Uh, so there, this is a there was a conference on this in Sweden last summer, I think, on the obstacle problem. Uh, and I think uh, that we should go back and do it this way uh, because it's really simple and it works. Uh, so the obstacle problem, minimize uh, for u greater than or equal to phi, one half grad u squared, you can add to it a penalty, an uh, indicator function, which basically says that u has to be greater than or equal to phi. And we don't have to do that. We can sh add something which is much less radical, just that uh, integral of u minus phi times a constant, so phi minus u. Uh, these splitting methods involve indicator functions, and there's a really nice paper by Lyons and Mercier a long time ago in which they did that. And nobody picked up on it. So what they proposed is exactly what we did, except that we have uh, made it into an unconstrained uh, uh, penalty problem, and it's fast, much faster. But it's, it's almost exactly the same algorithm. So they actually, in this very nice paper in 1979, they proved the convergence of something that looks a little bit like this, this so-called Douglas-Ratchford splitting. Do people know what that is? Okay. Douglas-Ratchford splitting has had an revi incredible revival in recent years because you are inverting uh, the identity plus the uh, subgradient, basically. And that's easy to do. Involve, in, screwing around with the subgradient is bad because it's multi-valued. But adding one plus lambda times the subgradient and inverting that is single value. And that's all you need for the Douglas Ratchford. And it keeps second order accuracy. So this is extremely popular and useful. Uh, things like it. In fact, split Bregman, for those of you who know about this stuff, is uh, Douglas Ratchford on the dual, it turns out. But OK, so if you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. Uh, it's not that important. <coughs> anyway, this is what those guys did in 1979 in a paper that's been more or less ignored by the numerical community. Okay, there's uh, lots of other applications I'll talk about in five minutes. The uh, uh, equilibrium state of an elastic membrane uh, looks very similar. Again, you can show that all you got to do is add mu1 and mu2, and not a penalty, not a not a constrained problem with an infinity, uh, with the mu's being infinite, but nice finite mu's. All of, and they're easy to solve, and you can solve them, as I said before, by doing these, uh, well, I'm not going to go through the equation 16 times, I've already done 13 times. Uh, each step is in one more time, Laplacian inverse plus, some, Laplacian plus something inverse followed by a shrink, period. So these things are easy to program. Uh, there you go, and there's the shrink, there's the classic shrink function, which has changed my life. Uh, and there's related work, which I will skip, but by these nice people. Healy Shore Flow is another one. Uh, this is England, oh my God, it must be people who love this stuff here. Okay. Uh, fluid dynamics, anyway. Uh, so you solve this problem, Laplacian P is equal to zero in a moving region, P is posited over there, one on the boundary, uh, and uh, Normal velocity is known on, on gamma sub t, that thing that's moving. Initial data is given. By the time you finish fooling around, you can solve it, you can reduce it to a simpler problem, which is over here. There it is. Uh, where's the simple problem? Okay, there's the simple problem after all is said and done. And one more time, that really short problem can be solved by, again, playing games with shrink and inverse Laplacian. And there you go, same, same, lo same looking thing. Laplace inverse shrink operator, add back the error, and you're in business. 
divisible sand pile. This is a pair box stuff about which I know very little, but it turns out that this is applicable there too. Uh, you have a grid point and you have a uh, density sigma. Sigma is greater than one. If you choose a grid point with sigma greater than, sorry, with sigma greater than one, look at the neighbors and distribute sigma minus one among the four neighboring grid points. This is the way sand piles are supposed to operate. Okay. You repeat until sigma is less than or equal to one everywhere. And the final state doesn't depend on the order in which you do this. And by God, you can solve that one more time as an L1 minimization problem. So you can do everything with L1 minimization, more or less. Uh, minimize grad u squared minus sigma u plus max of u comma zero. And here, the, here are the variational problems that we're solving, these four. And I'll show you the results and we're almost finished. Okay. You have free boundaries in four different places. And here a numerical example, here's an obstacle problem, which is an easy one. Uh, and uh, this is just gonna be a plane across the top of these two even guys, but it converges fast. Here's a two-dimensional example. Uh, and you can see the error, which is uh, scaled up. So the error is pretty small. Okay. Uh, this is what we did versus this beautiful paper by Leon's Mercier, which is 30 year, 25 years old. Uh, and we're about five times faster. Um, the only thing that we did, that was, the basic thing that we did was different was we replaced the uh, uh, penalty that they had Sorry, we replaced the uh, constraint that they had, which had an infinite mu by the penalty. And it's like five to 10 times faster. Okay. Uh, and, uh, ah. Smaller error converges faster, trust me, it's true. Okay, uh, okay and here's uh, the elliptic obstacle problem. We can get discontinuities or a discontinuous derivative, I should say, or an almost discontinuous derivative. Uh, okay. Three iterations. Uh, the thing about this Bregman nonsense is that it puts the singularities in the right place almost immediately. It takes forever, it takes a long time to get residuals and smooth parts down to zero. But it puts the uh, spikes and the uh, discontinuities, if you're looking for discontinuities, in the right place right away. The, uh, the day before yesterday, I heard about four talks on recovering spikes using uh, L1. And the answer is, yeah, you recover them, unless crazy things happen. But on top of that, you recover them really fast with this method. And, that's the, that's the, and then the rest of the stuff gets a little slower. Okay. Here's the uh, two-phase uh, uh, Healy Shore. There's a boundary between uh, positive, zero, and negative. And I think I'm almost finished. Oh, here's the, the sand pile. Okay, you have mass conservation. The initial's on the left and the final is on the right. And we get that fast using these PDE ideas. And there's a video which is not loadable. I'll skip. Okay. Uh, not much happened, just the end. So, okay, what we've done is uh, discuss the connection between free boundary problems and variational principles with an L1 term. And the moral of the story is L1 is great. I mean, uh, it gives you a convex optimization problem, which gives you compact support, it puts discontinuities in the right place, and it's fast. So uh, what else is good uh, and good for you? Uh, so what we want to do is use more applications, and we're pushing further on the Schrodinger stuff, like crazy. Do it. For those of you who know about this stuff, we're going to do Cone-Sham and so on. Okay. And that's it. Thanks. <laughs>